Welcome everybody to the Falling Walls circuit table on science in a multilateral world. My name is Jan-Martin Viada. I'm a Berlin-based journalism for education and research. The circuit tables are part of this year's World Science Summit, jointly hosted by Falling Walls and Berlin Science Week, and have given the spotlights to world-leading scientists, science strategists and policymakers from academia, business and politics to discuss how we can apply science research and innovation to get the world moving again. And this, I can promise you that, will be a very special circle table indeed. It's the last one in this week, and the panelists have known each other for many years. In fact, when Falling Wards started in 2009, three of them were ministers of science in their countries, and the fourth one was science advisor to the president. Even though they have different jobs and tasks now, they keep being among, among the most influential, most experienced science policy leaders worldwide. And maybe the best part, they can speak more freely now than those who are in office right now, which makes a panel on current and future challenges to global society and how science and science policy can work together to overcome these challenges even more worthwhile. And it's also a little bit like a class reunion to the four of them. Let me introduce them to you. A warm welcome to Andrei Fuzenko, who has been Minister of Education and Science of the Russian Federation between 2004 and 2012. In 2012, he became aide to the president of the Russian Federation. In his earlier life as scientist, he has been deputy director for research at the Yov Physical Technical Institute of the Soviet Academy, Academy of Science. A warm welcome to you, Andrei Fuzenko. Hello. I'd like to welcome Wang Gang. He has been Minister of Science and Technology of the People's Republic of China between 2007 and 2018. Now he is, among other tasks, President of the Ninth National Committee of the China Association for Science and Technology. He, has, he is an engineer. He obtained a doctorate at Klausthal University of Technology here in Germany, and he has been President of Tongji University. Welcome, Professor Wan. And I'd like to welcome John P. Holdren. He has been President Obama's science advisor and Senate confirmed director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy between 2009 and 2017. Now he is professor of environmental policy at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and he is co-director of the school's science, technology, and public pro uh, policy programs, which of course, as with all the panelists, is only a little part of his academic and societal engagement. Great to have you here, Professor Holden. Thank you. And finally, I would like to welcome the woman who had the idea for this circle table, Annette Chavan, who has been Federal Minister of Education and Research between 2005 and 2013. Between 2014 and 2018, she has served as German ambassador to the Holy See. Great to have you here, Mrs. Chavan. Hello. And um, I really have to say, given the international state of affairs, or the state of international affairs, this is indeed a very special panel. So my first question to you, Annette Chavan, how hard was it to bring your former colleagues together to be here today? No, it was quite easy because we are in, in very good contacts. Wang Gang and I are working and are the chairman of a Chinese-German dialogue forum Andre Fosenko visits regularly Falling Walls, so we can meet in Berlin. And my last visit um, with Jürgen Lüneck in Washington in the office of John Haldren is about 10 years ago. So we are very happy to have you here today. And I remember this visit was a little bit difficult because I forgot, had forgotten my passport in the hotel. So. It, it was not possible to come into the office, so we met in a bistro near the office. This is now, I think, nine or ten years ago, but I thought it's a, it's a, good, uh, it's a good opportunity after now ten or eleven years falling walls to meet again and to talk in the special time about relationship between, between policy and science and uh, which experiences we uh, made in the last months in all our countries and what these experiences may 
may uh, change in the relationship mm -hmm. between policy and science. So, in addition to Van, why is science different from other policy fields? What makes it different? Uh, science policy is a science international for, uh, since the beginning, not only in the global world. So there is a lot of experiences and I'm sure, in my view, science and science policy is a very good way, is a very good strategy to build bridges and to work in, in a way like diplomacy for trust. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I'd like to move on to Van Gang. Together with Annette Chavan, we have already heard that you are the co-speakers of the German-Chinese Dialogue Forum. And how important, from your point of view, are science and science policy to bridge political frictions between governments? Van Gang, you are going to be interpreted, you're going to speak in Chinese, we will hear the answer in English. So how hard is it? frictions between governments? Uh, in fact, I was watching your video and I was quite emotional for a second because when the Berlin Wall fell, I was studying in Germany and I witnessed how a wall can be broken down and enhance people-to-people -people links. Politicians and scientists approach each other and get into contact. And in the beginning, this needs to be a relationship of mutual respect. And we need to have a mutual respect for facts and science. It doesn't matter whether it's a domestic policy or international cooperation. The most important thing is that we need to build the bridges and have clear channels for people to have free and unhindered communication among themselves because science and research itself, just like what uh, Annette had just mentioned in her remarks, it is an international relationship and international cooperation. Not anyone or any one country could do all the work on his or her own. And this needs to be done with the cooperation of international scientists and the science community. And when the scientists work together, they form friendships and such friendships will in turn promote political mutual trust and exchanges among countries. Thank you so much. And I'd like to move on to Andrei Fosenko. We know that there are and have been tensions between the European Union and Russia. Things have been complicated for quite a while now. Do you feel that even science policy and scientific cooperation gets more and more affected by this, Andre? I don't think that in, uh, in our area, in area of education, science, we have uh, some tension. More than over, I think all my colleagues and me also uh, understand that uh, our, uh, our responsibility builds uh, bridges, as Annette said. And maybe today it's even more important than in other uh, times. I can tell you that uh, today we uh, have addi additional motivation to stop coronavirus because our communication in offline, uh, which was, uh, I think, uh, can be much more efficient than uh, online in the construction of the bridges. And uh, to establish uh, and to support this rather close communication not only with the European Union uh, scientists, but with uh, scientists all the world. Mm -hmm. Sometimes my impression is that researchers and scientists look a little bit puzzled at the political affairs and wonder why, why, why not everybody can just work together as they do, Andrei Fosenko. Is that true? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure that I understand, uh, but uh, I think that at least uh, in uh, our country and I think I know that in the other one I communicate uh, permanently with my uh, colleagues in uh, other countries uh, all of us understand that uh, if we part of the policy it uh, can be it's, it's have to be the positive part of this policy and uh, I think that in some sense I am uh, maybe only from my colleagues uh, still in the official position 
but I don't feel that uh, something wrong in my approaches and my understanding of these topics. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And John P. Holdren, I'd like to, to ask you about uh, the situation in the US, which is very interesting to the rest of the world right <laughs> now. Let me start out by talking about the approach of many countries and many governments towards the cor corona crisis. Also, German leaders are proud that they have based some or most of their decisions in the crisis on research, uh, on, on scientific advice by researchers. Is it fair to say that in US politics, that hasn't been true for quite a while, John? Well, I would start by saying that the main failure has been at the very top, the failure of President Trump uh, and Vice President Pence to take seriously the crucial insights from science and technology that are needed to effectively address the COVID-19 crisis. It's interesting to note that in spite of that failure at the top, scientists uh, from the biomedical and public health domains across the country have been very energetically engaged with the governors of individual states, with the mayors of individual cities, with the public health departments across the nation, injecting the insights from science and technology, particularly with respect to testing, contact tracing, the use of masks, social distancing. And the result is that the response across the United States has been uneven. Uh, the sad fact is what we have lacked above all is a coherent, comprehensive national strategy for addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. And what it underscores is that we need leaders at the top who understand how and why science and technology insights are relevant to understanding and to addressing virtually every major challenge that today's societies face, not just health, but our economies, our security, our environment, the challenge of global climate change. In every instance, one can neither understand nor respond appropriately without understanding the contributions from science and technology and the constraints that understandings from science and technology sometimes impose on the solutions that are practical. President-elect Joe Biden has already vowed that science-based action will be, uh, that he will just return to science-based action uh, in the White House. And he announced top scientists would be appointed to his coronavirus task force right away. So what, what do you think about that? John. Well, first of all, I, I worked very closely for eight years, both with President Obama and with Vice President Biden. And I can assure you that the priorities with respect to science and technology that characterize the Obama administration, respect for science and technology at the top, the inclusion of scientists and technologists at the table for crucial decisions, those practices will without question uh, be reproduced under uh, the new President of the United States as of January 20th, 2021, Joe Biden and his Vice President Kamala Harris. There is no doubt in my mind whatsoever about the degree of understanding of the importance of science and technology, the respect for facts that will once again characterize the leadership of the US mm -hmm. government in Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. So is there a new respect for facts emerging internationally? Oh, oh, Professor Wan, please go ahead. I would like to make some additional remarks on what John had mentioned. In fact, the biggest problem we're facing today is COVID-19 and the restriction it has posed on us, especially with the flow of people. But the scientists of our countries have not reduced their exchanges and communication. CAST, my association, since the very beginning of the COVID uh, crisis, had hosted more than 300 cross-disciplinary, and especially uh, in life sciences, life sciences and medicine, uh, international forums. and more than 80% of scientists of our three countries have participated and discussed on these forums. And so political issues could not stop scientists uh, 
to talk to each other because even though we can't see each other, we still have that innate need to to listen to each other's voices and use the internet as a basis for our communication. So from a Chinese perspective, China and Russia had established science uh, scientific cooperation mechanism and this is uh, still working very robustly. We, between China and Russia, we have the uh, Innovation Cooperation Year, and we've started the activities in August. With John, we have signed two strategic uh, working plans on science and technology at the White House, and this has been extended to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so we have a, a systemic uh, guarantee to our cooperation, even though sometimes the intergovernmental uh, relationships might run into some ebbs and flows, but we can still work together based on our common understanding and respect for science. And I believe it has been strength during these years. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Andre Fuzenko, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you see, uh, my dear friends, we so often talk about the grand challenges and about the opportunity for the science to show uh, their, their powerful uh, to uh, overcome uh, grand challenges. And now we have a uh, very wonderful chance to realize our opportunities. I think I agree with John that uh, this problem, problem with the uh, coronavirus, it's uh, only a small part of more wide challenges connected with the environment, connected with uh, uh, some other uh, problems, for example, with uh, uh, climate change. Uh, with, and uh, I think it's very important that if we begin to talk about these uh, uh, problems uh, more comprehensive, not to talk only about the medical problems, but talk about the more um, uh, situation with the climate change which influence on the new infection. We can talk about the, also about the opportunity, opportunities when we uh, get uh, with any grand challenges, not only problems, but opportunities. And I think that it's a real motivation for all of us, for our science, for our communication for our cooperation to talk uh, to talk about uh, to talk about to improve our opportunities i remember our talk um, with uh, john holdran in kazan when he said that when we discussed that uh, talk uh, competition cooperation in science the balance between these two things have to be more close to the cooperation and I, I hope, I hope very much that uh, in the new realities, we realize this approach, John, uh, because I remember we said that it's very important not only for the scientists, but also the political politicians. Maybe if you hope that a new administration can uh, shift this balance in the position of the cooperation. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So, Annette Chavan, would you agree that there is a new respect for facts emerging internationally, a more respect and also more respect from politicians for science? Is that a development brought along by, by the corona crisis? Yes, I think this is uh, our experience in, in Germany and I think it's experience in other countries. And now the great hope is that the experiences we made in the last months will be relevant for other issues. So there are a lot of issues, for example, climate change, biodiversity, uh, fight against hunger and poverty, all these great future uh, uh, problems um, are issues which cannot be solved by only one region in the world or one country or one society. Now, our main experience is everyone is affected. And this is not only for this time of pandemic. It will be in future in case of a lot of problems and questions. And so the hope is that we come to more solidarity and that science and science policy can 
can promote this solidarity, this cooperation, this friendship, this new uh, bridges uh, for the future. So what makes you so optimistic about that? Researchers have warned of the consequences of the climate crisis for many years. And this is something that also uh, science policymakers have had on their minds for quite a long time. But if you look at the political reactions, if you look at the political strategies, there have been no conclusive reactions for a long, long time. And um, even though some would argue that the, 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 the risks of the climate crisis are even more severe than the risks of the coronavirus. So first, Annette, and then I would like to hear John about that. So what makes you optimistic that this will stick around once the corona crisis, the crisis is over? It seems to me that, that this, the difference between climate change and other issues and this pandemic is that now in all societies people feel this pandemic and the consequences very um, very concrete um, climate change for most of people most of the regions of the world is a little bit maybe abstract and so the experiences now may help us to understand and to explain the other issues are, are um, maybe more important than what we, what we make uh, uh, or what we feel uh, during this type of pandemic. I think this is a difference. The very concrete situation now, people feel that something has happened which is very dangerous and other issues which are a little bit abstract. John Holdren. Thank you. I would make two comments. Uh, first of all, I would not quite agree with the comment that not very much has happened. The Paris Agreement in December of 2015 was an enormous step forward in the international response to the challenge of climate change. And while President Trump announced soon after his inauguration that the United States would withdraw from the Paris Agreement, uh, and that undermined to some extent uh, the enthusiasm and, and effectiveness of, of the agreement even more widely, it is undoubtedly to be expected that a President Joe Biden will restore U.S. participation in the Paris Agreement as one of his first acts in office. Uh, the second point I would make is that Although uh, Aneta is certainly correct that for many people, climate change uh, over the years has seemed to be somewhat abstract, that has been changing very rapidly. We are seeing in our everyday lives more of the most powerful storms, more torrential downpours and severe flooding, larger and hotter wildfires, the spread of tropical diseases into more uh, northerly uh, climates. We are seeing changes in the distribution of species on which people depend for their livelihoods, uh, fish and shellfish, uh, for example. And so it is now the case that in virtually every country in the world, something over 70% of the population accept and agree that climate change is happening, it's caused by humans, it's already causing harm, and it requires a greater public response. Uh, the other thing that's been happening is the remedies have been getting less expensive. Wind power, solar energy, batteries, electric vehicles, efficient buildings. The fact that the symptoms are getting worse and the remedies are getting cheaper is the reason I am optimistic that we will, as a world, take increasingly effective action against global climate change. Mm -hmm. Van Gang, please go ahead. Uh, 
I would like to also echo what the two previous speakers had mentioned. What I feel was when I was the minister, most of the work is done on the policy level. And now as the head of uh, CAST, what I am doing more is to con get into contact with the science community. And I had felt that since the beginning of this year, when I was talking to uh, scientists uh, in China or around the world, everyone had been educated by the COVID-19 pandemic. It has told us that when we're facing a common crisis of the mankind, the only thing we can do is proactive cooperation, and this is the only way to resolve these problems. When you talked about climate change, indeed, it uh, is associated with a lot of risks, and among the scientists or the science community, this is an absolute consensus. But how we can implement the policies, this needs the work of the economic uh, field and our businesses. Uh, a very simple example, before I was the um, minister, I was the chief scientist and also president of Tongji University, and I was in charge of the new energy vehicles development in China. And this year, I took a look in Europe and especially in Germany, all of the auto industry had been slipping. However, new energy vehicles up until September, its growth was 150%. And so our businesses are very clear uh, in that we have to counter climate change. And Chinese businesses is the same. In the beginning of this year, we have seen some quick slide of the uh, new energy vehicles, but until September, we have surpassed the level of last year. And we believe by the end of the year, we would end up with a production of 1.2 million units. And in 2012, I had uh, gotten known with uh, John, and he was working at the uh, Kennedy School. And we had been uh, discussing at that time about the policy and uh, science research on new energy vehicles. And now we can see, even though we're talking about it from a science perspective, we want this to be put into action in our respective countries. But of course, we have to rely on the understanding and acceptance of the market. When all the users understand that new energy vehicle is the future, and every one of us would need to do something for uh, countering climate change. I believe that is the thing that we have learned from our fight with COVID-19. Everyone need to have proactive uh, actions towards the future. Everybody is seeing opportunities here. Andre, please go ahead. Yes. I, uh, you see, I, 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 I'm not afraid that I... Uh give the right translation, but in Russia we have some proverb that uh, until the thunder uh, don't break, the nobody go to the church. You see, it's, uh, and now we, uh, we have a real problem, and because of it, everybody began to think not only about the coronavirus, but about the old problems connected with the uh, grand challenges, with the ch very big changes, you know that because of the climate change, for example, the border of the infection, which uh, usually uh, exists in the south, now move more and more to the north. You see, it's one of the reasons to think not about the medicine, but about the climate change. Another story is that um, I uh, think it's very important to talk about all these problems together as a one big problem, as a very comprehensive approach. Because um, we, uh, if we begin to think, uh, begin to solve one uh, so small short uh, uh, question, for example, coronavirus. Coronavirus, uh, of course, is pandemic, but I think, it's my opinion, I think that it's not the most terrible uh, uh, infection. And I think it exactly it's not the last in, uh, uh, infection which we'll get in the nearest future. And because of it, we, I think we have to think about the more, uh, uh, more wide approach, more integrated approach for all these problems. Climate change, it's one of the basements. I agree with uh, my colleagues, with uh, John, with Annette, it's a very, complicated and the very basement for the all our uh, all our questions today 
and uh, I want to tell two things which uh, once more, which I think uh, important for all of us, for our international scientific society. First of all, we have a very, we have a lack of available and reliable information about our problems, connected with the medicine, with the infection, connected with the climate change. And I think another one, once more, I'm sorry, I repeat it more and more. We have the absence of the comprehensive approach for all these problems. Problems. It's a responsibility of the scientific society. And I think, uh, I remember our discussion in Carnegie Group. We talk about it. It's, a, it's a one question. It's a very, very uh, wide one question. How we can uh, discuss, how we can evaluate um, all the world with all these mm -hmm. features, not the only one uh, all right. part of this. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And this is one question that I would like to, to um, while moving on to John Holdren, who also wanted to say something, I would like to throw in the question, how can we form those new alliances, international alliances that obviously are necessary from what Andre Fosenko has just said. But John Holdren, please go ahead. The first thing I wanted to say in following up uh, my friend Wan Gong's comment is that there was one small problem in the translation. Uh, the problem in the translation said that we had been cooperating on uh, clean and efficient vehicles starting in 2012. And the actual start, and I'm sure this is what uh, Wan Gong said, of that particular collaboration was 2002. And the significance of that is that by the time Wan Gong became Minister of Science and Technology and I became the science advisor to President Obama, we had already been working together on science and technology for seven years. And the trust, the friendship, the ability to communicate that we had established in our seven years of collaboration as scientists and technologists enabled us to achieve much more, I think, in our work together on US-China science and technology collaboration than would have been possible without that previous uh, scientific engagement. And that raises a broader question. The reason, I think, that scientists and technologists have an easier time communicating and collaborating across international boundaries is that there is a mutual respect for achievement in science and technology which are non-ideological fields by their nature, a mutual respect based on achievement in those fields that enables the very quick building of bonds and the capacity to communicate among scientists and technologists. That capacity is slower to build and harder to build among political leaders as a general matter. And it's one of the responsibilities of scientists, I think, to try to use that enhanced capacity to communicate and to collaborate to build stronger collaboration uh, among our countries and including our leaders. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Annette Chavan, is there a chance to build new alliances now in international science policy and what alliances could we imagine? What alliances could we think of? Yes, I think there's a great chance now and uh, in my view a very important point will be to to uh, special attention should be paid to the situation of young scientists we should think about the next generation the young si scientists all over the world this is for me the for me this is the, the primary group for new alliances and we have all these partnerships between universities, partnerships between the academies in our science academies in our countries. And I think in these last months, so it's my hope, but as you said, I'm optimistic that they got a feeling in which special way politicians and scientists uh, don't work with dogmas but they are seekers they try to find solutions the politicians for for the community solutions for the communities and all the political issues 
and the scientists, um, they try to find knowledge and, and, um, and solutions for the great problems in our world, problems for the future. So I think our scientists made new experiences with the politicians. They made experience which, in my view, were very positive. And so they are now they are busy to to come to new alliances in our countries and in the international area. Yes, I think now it's the right time for new alliances. Well, basically, you're talking about international exchange <laughs> also among young researchers. But at the same time, we know or we fear that international mobility might be hindered for a long time, that it might not be possible to have academic mobility as we knew it. So what does that mean to your hopes, Annette Chavan? Yes, in, in the last months, the situation became more, um, more difficult for the young scientists it's, uh, in, in all countries. And therefore, in the governments, in the academies, in the universities, they should think about strategies. There are a lot of talents all over the world and they need good opportunities uh, to work with their talents, um, with their curiosity, and maybe that they need more and better strategies than in the past, especially in this time of uh, pandemic. Uh, André uh, said it, it is the first pandemic we remember, but it will not be the last one. And therefore we need now new strategies for the next generation so that they can, can work well. Mm -hmm. Do you see that your successors have um, understood that? But Andre Fusenko, you go first, but maybe you would like to answer that question very, as well. Very briefly. Your successors have the, understood that. For the young people, uh, communications online are much more comfortable for them for us. And I think for them it's more easier to cooperate and communicate and uh, develop uh, with the online also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, John Holdren. Yes, I just wanted to add, uh, and this is in the same line as uh, my friend Andre Frosenko just mentioned, there is a tremendous amount of communication among young people, including young scientists, that's going on uh, on the internet with platforms uh, like Zoom. Uh, I am involved in collaborations uh, across uh, the entire Arctic region on uh, climate change in the Arctic and, and how to address its challenges. And we have uh, students, postdoctoral fellows from every Arctic nation uh, taking part very energetically in this collaboration. Uh, similarly, I'm involved uh, continually in collaborations uh, with China on, uh, on energy, on climate change, on uh, international collaboration in science. And in those interactions as well, there are young people on both sides, Chinese uh, and Americans, who are very energetically involved in this collaboration. I think despite the obstacles that the pandemic has posed, and despite the obstacles that international tensions are posing, the enthusiasm for collaboration among young scientists and technologists has not diminished. It has actually increased. Mm -hmm. Van Gang, please go ahead. I think between politics and science, if we wanted to achieve optimal cooperation, the most important basis is the respect for science and for facts. It doesn't matter if it's uh, uh, climate change or the pandemic. This is the most important foundation. And the pursuits of, uh, pol of scientists and their demands need to have a, a, a game um, with the resources allocated to them by politicians. But when we have the same aligned goals, the science community will be able to achieve that balance. And as policymakers and politicians ourselves, what we need to do is to 
look at the direction that's formed, pointed out by the science community with climate change. There are a lot of long-term goals and some more uh, near goals or, or short-term goals. And if we're clear about these goals, it is uh, when we can achieve that consensus between politics and science, things can get done better and sooner. Young scientists are our hope. And at any time, we cannot forget their importance. They need to have, on the one hand, education and fostering. On the other hand, on the internet in this era, their capabilities far exceed that are ours. And within a very short time, they can become our lecturers and we must learn from them. And so I believe the most important point about politics and science is the mutual respect and aligned goals. Thank you very much. So let's talk about money for a minute, about, run, about funding of research. We know that the coronavirus situation has affected the worldwide economy in a very drastic way. We know that many economies also of your respective countries have been affected by, by the virus pandemic. And we will, we will see uh, governments that lack funding. We see that the tax money is going down. We see that there might not be the same funding for anything in the future. Um, so what does that mean to, to research? What does that mean to science? John, you, you are very optimistic that the new administration will have a different approach towards research and science, but also the new administration will not be able to to print money in, in just excessive ways. Sure, that's absolutely true. And for the uh, short term, uh, clearly the pandemic has produced a setback in the availability of resources in governments around the world. But our economies will recover. Uh, and I believe, uh, as they do, the recognition that science and technology are going to be crucial to the solution of all of our major problems across society will result in uh, increased support across governments for the research and development investments that are needed. I would also add that uh, certainly in the United States, one is seeing a major increase in philanthropy, in foundations, in wealthy individuals, in supporting uh, scientific research. And uh, I think increasingly the uh, community of, of wealth, the financial community, uh, the uh, big private sector companies are going to be increasingly engaged uh, over time. Uh, you may recall that Jeff Bezos, the uh, founding chief uh, executive officer of Amazon, has pledged $10 billion uh, for work on climate change alone. Uh, I think everybody knows that Bill Gates, uh, one of the richest people in the world, is uh, very heavily engaged with other uh, wealthy individuals in ensuring mm -hmm. that the funding for science and technology uh, will go up and not down. Mm -hmm. Annette Chavan, we have a different situation in Germany. There are not that many philanthropists that uh, will donate so much money to science and research. But when you became minister in 2005, or since you became minister in 2005, there was a huge hike in public spending or federal money spending on research. Actually, a hike that hasn't been stopped until now. So do you, are you optimistic that this will go on like this? Will we see more and more public spending, federal spending on research in Germany? Or is this something that's going to end now because there's simply no money anymore? Oh, I think we have a European a strategy with a Lisboa strategy, 3% uh, for R&D. And uh, I think in this time of pandemic, we should realize that these 3% are most important for future. And, and so I, I don't know. And uh, maybe that there are a lot of other priorities now, but the politicians they know and the science organizations as well um, that investment for r d must have priority because all other ways um, are more complicated and combined with more money so this is the the the, the strategy 
this 3%. And in a lot of European countries, we need more money so that this will be possible, so that Europe can reach this uh, 3%. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, the Lisbon strategy has been quite a few years old already, and we are not really European-wide. Yeah, exactly. And European-wide, we are not really moving into that direction so fast. One gun first, and then Andre Fosenko. One gun, please go ahead. Actually, I had mentioned especially that we need the scientists need to have resource inputs and the resources can be divided into four categories. The first one is the treasury input and it has a cap. It can be a large amount, but it has a cap and it is invested into foundational research facing the future. And the second part of the resources is in fact the tax policies. If we can use tax policies or preferential tax policies to encourage businesses to invest in R&D, they will do that on their own steam. They'll uh, provide funds for uh, the uh, the science uh, community. I was working in Audi for many years before in the general planning department. I remember at that time businesses investment into R&D is quite a large percentage of the total money they get. And thirdly, from the general population or from our society, I agree with what John said. There will always be a group of people who are more affluent and uh, affluent sooner than others. And we need to encourage them and provide them with the incentives so that they're willing to pay for R&D. And fourthly, they're not just using money, they're also creating money, the scientists. If we provide them with a bigger room, with more liberty and freedom, and they can use what they create in the lab to translate that into commercial results and technologies, they'll be further incentivized. And so from these four areas, we can pull our resources to invest in R&D in the future. And this is why I believe these uh, scientific policies is a comprehensive uh, sweet and also include international cooperation it requires us as ministries and departments to explain that well to our national leaders and this can help the general population to increase its input into science and research and so i talked about resources and i specifically didn't use the word fund or money thank you <laughs> Thank you very much. Andre Fosenko and then John Holdren. Yes, it's I, 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 I really my my friends, my colleagues uh, tell, uh, <laughs> tell everything what I want, but uh, one additional. First of all, is I agree with Annette, it's priorities. If you really can uh, give the priority and explain why it's a priority, very important for the social stability, for the future of the economy, you always can get the money. The other one, and I think it's very important. Today in Russia, business began really uh, give money for some uh, priorities. For example, for the climate change. Uh, in a few years ago, it was absolutely impossible. Today, they have a real communication, very real partnership between business who propose, uh, it's not philanthropy. They invest, in, uh, they invest money in the new approaches and they... Uh, really invest money in uh, decreasing of emission and uh, increasing se sequester for the carbon. And I think it's a very good s signal and I'm sure that uh, this process will be improved. Mm -hmm. John Holdren. Uh, two, two quick points. Uh, one, I want to uh, endorse what Andre Fosenko has just said, namely that responses uh, to climate change uh, are many of them going to make money uh, much more than costing money. Uh, and industry has come to recognize that and we are going to see, we are seeing already around the world, uh, rapidly increasing investments uh, by the private sector in responding to climate change. We are also of course seeing rapidly increasing investments in parts of the private sector in how to respond to pandemics and that too uh, will have long-term economic benefits. But I also want to emphasize Wang Gong's final point. 
uh, about international collaboration. International collaboration actually makes research and development more efficient. It shares costs, it pools talents, it shares risks. And if we increase our international collaboration in science and technology, we will also make it, in a sense, less expensive per unit of advance that it generates, because it is simply more efficient to collaborate than not to. Which is probably the language that policymakers will understand most easily, which is probably the right way to put it. Thank you so much. So we talked almost the, the whole last hour about uh, science as a diplomacy of trust and how science can, can contribute to the development worldwide, especially to recovering also from a crisis like the Corona crisis. So for a final round of statements, I would like to ask all of you the same question. Um, the, the, the relationship between science and policy has two sides, the scientists and the researchers. So if you have one request to scientists to make this relationship even a better one, what would that be? And on the other hand, if you have one request to pol policymakers, to politicians, to make that relationship better, what would that be? So one request to scientists, one request to policymakers. Annette Chavani, would you like to start? Uh, first, I think <laughs> the same situation for the scientists and the policymakers is they are seekers. They try to find solutions. The difference between politicians and scientists, politicians have to decide for the community. They have to work with a lot of very different interests. And for the scientists, sometimes it's not, it is not so easy to understand why there are such a lot of interests and such a lot of very different interests and misunderstandings and so on and so on. And so I, I think in this relationship it's necessary to have um, uh, to have passion for the job of the others. But then if this is present passion, respect, as we said, respect for the facts, then I think it's um, it's a very um, attractive relationship between these both groups who are so important for the future in our societies. And, and both the scientists and the politicians are not only working in their own community, in their own um, um, uh, state or government, they both are working more and more in several international contexts and i think this is this is a good uh, a good uh, chance and uh, and and for me this uh, talk now the last 60 minutes was a very hopeful talk we could see that um, those who have experiences in policy uh, and in sciences are um, are very hopefully and very mm -hmm. optimistic, and I think this is a this is a good uh, uh, good thing at the evening before falling walls uh, tomorrow will um, will realized in Berlin. Thank you very much, Andrei Fosenko. Also, one request yeah. for scientists, one for researchers, uh, for for politicians. Yes, you see, I remember. Um, Two years ago, in the following walls, was the main topic for the Chatham House, a science in a time of the post-truth area. And I think it was a very interesting discussion. And um, I think that um, uh, maybe for the science and even more challenge than for the politicians, because uh, science is uh, exactly uh, can be uh, correlated with the post-truth era. Some politicians can be. And uh, maybe uh, the main questions for both of them is reliable information. Uh, reliable information uh, which can be, uh, to which can be, can be trusted. Mm -hmm. It's a problem. And how to do it? Only one thing, reputation. In the science, maybe the reputation uh, Good reputation more important than the policy. 
now we have to do all the best to realize this approach. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Van Gang, please go ahead. From a science perspective, to the scientists, I would like to say international cooperation is an innate need. John and I had started working since 2002, and it went beyond uh, my post since 2007. For the five years prior to my posting as the minister, we have not applied for any funding, but we have seen a lot of progress in our policy, and our students had been uh, in, in engaging with each other and we're taking money out of our own budget to help them to work together and so this is why i say it is an innate need and what we want is to have a stable external environment and my request for the politicians is to to do your very best to guarantee that stable environment to make it conducive for their exchanges so they can build relationships and have achievements. Politically, countries and countries will have differences. However, any politician should know this. Scientists and scientific cooperation can only deepen the mutual understanding and trust among countries. And this is the angle I wanted to take. I want politicians to make a stable environment for the science community. And of course, if they can put in more resources, more money, especially more money to the young scientists for their international communications, I would have three hands and I would raise them all in uh, consent. Thank you so much. And Thank I you. would like to give the final word to John Holder because the US is just before a new start when it comes to the relationship between science and policy. And so the same question to you, one request to scientists, to researchers, one request to politicians. Thank you very much. What I hope scientists will do is dedicate at least 10% of their time. Every scientist, every engineer dedicates 10% or more of her time or his time to engagement with policy, and to the education of the public about the interaction of science and technology with policy. The request I would have of political leaders is that every political leader should ensure that her or his science and technology advisors are present for every policy discussion of matters of consequence before their nations. The insights from science and technology will never be all that the decision makers need to know, but it will always be something that they need to know. And if scientists and engineers are not at the table, their insights will not be able to be heard, opportunities will be lost, mistakes will be made. The scientists and technologists who are advising government need to be at the table for every important discussion. And I think we will see that going forward now in the United States, uh, as it was in the Obama-Biden administration, it will now be so in the Biden-Harris administration. The scientists and technologists will be at the table, their insights will be heard, and to the extent that that is true all around the world, we will make faster uh, progress on all of the challenges that our societies face. Science in a multilateral world. John Holdren, André Fusenko, Van Gang, and Shavan, thank you very much for your time and for your insight. Thank you all also for being here and discussing such in such a lively way. And I would like to thank, say thank you to Falling Walls for bringing all of you together to this interesting panel, which has, which has been the last of 21 circle tables actually and just don't miss the falling walls grand final tomorrow morning um, or tomorrow afternoon at 1 p.m november 9th over the past month nearly 1000 nominees from 111 countries have made the journey to become the science breakthrough of the year in this session the 10 falling walls breakthroughs of the year present their work ranging from the full spectrum of scientific disciplines 
This is a must-see for all curious minds who strive to answer one core question, which are the next walls to fall in science and technology. This and all other events are accessible on www.falling-walls.com for free. Please check out their website and the entire program featuring over 200 individual events. Thank you so much and goodbye.